thanks for joining today. Uh, my name is Riyad. I'm in charge of integrations at ClickHouse. And today I am with Dale to talk about our Kafka integration and what you can build with it. So you want to introduce yourself, Dale? Hi, I'm Dale. I'm part of the product team at ClickHouse. Uh, I do a lot of technical content. I originally worked on the Go driver for ClickHouse. And these days, yeah, mostly focusing on technical enablement and uh, using our product. So I'll start with the pretty simple question. Have you heard of ClickHouse before? Everyone here in the room? Cool, great. So I'll kind of go pretty quick on the intro then. So it's a widely successful open source project. And I'd like to think of it as a kind of the Postgres counterpart in the OLAP space. So, you know, like Postgres is kind of now established in the OSS OLTP category. ClickHouse is almost the same, but on the OLAP space. It was open source in 2016, so seven years ago, and got widely adopted. It means that it also grew kind of organically by user contributions, by user requests, and it gained a pretty good coverage of features. Of course, focused on performance, colon-oriented, great compression, great hardware footprint, millisecond scale queries, it's also a distributed system that can basically scale to any scale and runs mostly analytics use cases to power queries in embedded analytics or business intelligence. So there's a lot of use cases for ClickHouse. This is by no means an exhaustive list, but we tried here to summarize the main ones. I think the main one is this like real-time analytics in the middle where basically you manage continuous streams of events that you continuously ingest, and you try to answer questions on top of that. It's a category now. We have other uh, vendors in that space, obviously. Uh, I guess the main difference is that ClickHouse is uh, really focused on performance here. It's written in C++. There's a lot of Java-based software in that space. ClickHouse is written in C++ with a deep focus on scale and performance, meaning that even like a single node can perform pretty well and you don't need a huge hardware footprint. We operate like pretty large workloads on quite small hardware footprints compared to what they serve. And there's like other like kind of satellite use cases that gravitate around this. Like you can power user facing applications with analytics capabilities. It's your bank account app telling you how much you spend per category, for example or some kind of embedded analytics experiences like a cloud provider showing you logs or metrics. Uh, you can put it on top of an existing data warehouse. So if you're running something like a Snowflake, a BigQuery, a Redshift, and you want to speed up this experience, you can add ClickHouse on top as a speed layer, ingest data in both systems, and expose them for various types of users. A very prominent use case is also observability. Since we're pretty good at answering queries at scale, a lot of users notice that it's a smart idea to put uh, machine-generated data in there and just observe machines and how they react. So I think it's, it's becoming one of our biggest use cases. We have big names in that space, like eBay, like Uber. A lot of people are putting uh, data in there for this use case. We have vector storage capabilities in ClickHouse, so make it suitable for uh, basically ML and data science use cases. And finally, a lot of people just aggregate data in ClickHouse and plug in their favorite visualization tool to power their BI use cases. But we're here at the current event, so obviously it's all about Kafka, and it's an interesting relationship between ClickHouse and Kafka because it's a multimodal relationship. We have more than one way to integrate with Kafka, and it can get confusing if you're not really familiar with that space. And the reason is that because ClickHouse is designed for real-time analytics and Kafka is for real-time data. And these are two categories that are really close, not just on the words and on the semantics, but also on the decision power they provide. So if you are making data-driven decisions, these decisions are greatly enhanced if you're getting as fresh data as it gets, right? It's, it seems obvious, but for people that have never really got exposed to this, it's, it's non-trivial. So you can answer based on your awareness of a situation, but if you get the latest data, then your 
decision power is enhanced, especially if this decision are made automatically, it's based on an alerting scenario or anything. And for this, we always invested in the product. Many open source contributions added Kafka capabilities to ClickHouse. By Kafka capabilities, it can be pretty simple, like the code block you see on the top is called the Kafka table engine. It's a table engine you'll find in open source ClickHouse that allows you to declare a Kafka consumer inside your ClickHouse server or inside your ClickHouse cluster. It's pretty simple to use. You just declare it, you provide a schema, you provide your connection details, etc., And then you can attach a materialized view in ClickHouse to this special kind of integration table and you start consuming right away, turning your cluster into a powerful Kafka consumer. And it's pretty exclusive in terms of, uh, I guess, database who's, who's it is also Kafka client in that case. So that can power a lot of use cases. The only minor drawback is that the workload of Kafka consumption is collocated with the rest of your cluster in that case. So you compete actually for resources with ingest queries, with select queries, and with everything that's happening on the same environment in that setup. So for that, we had users that prefer running their Kafka consumption outside of ClickHouse, which Makes a lot of sense if you're already running something like Kafka Connect Framework, for example. And there is more than one way. As you see here, there's like three ways <laughs> to connect with the Kafka Connect Framework. You can just pick the generic options like the JDBC connector. ClickHouse is a database, and you can use the JDBC protocol as a sync to ClickHouse. ClickHouse also provides, besides its native interface with the ClickHouse native protocol, an HTTP interface that's quite powerful and versatile. So you can use the HTTP sync connector from Confluent in that case. And it's pretty powerful. Uh, it's handy if you're in, in an IT setup where there is uh, rerouting and HTTP is a protocol that many IT organizations know how to reroute and scale and secure. Also, you can use our officially provided ClickHouse sync. We are pretty happy about this one. We released it earlier this year in GA. It was running in beta for like maybe six months, and now it's officially GA. This one comes with exactly one semantics, so that's a pretty neat uh, use case, especially in the analytics space. Or you can run anything from Vector, for example, which is like a lightweight agent to read from data sources or push to ClickHouse, or write your own consumer producer app in your favorite programming language. We have clients for every language. But the new player in town, <laughs> is a dedicated experience for ClickHouse Cloud, which is called ClickPipes, which provides native connectivity services part of the cloud experience. And you'll see in the, with the demo we will run how this integration works, that this experience allows you to declare a Kafka consumer inside ClickHouse Cloud in less than a minute and start ingesting data without having to worry about managing this component, without having to worry about anything. And for this, <laughs> we try to think about a real-time data set that's representative of uh, the scale of ClickHouse, but also of, comes with this like strong real-time requirement, and we could not think of a better data set than flights data. So I'll hand it over to Dale to talk about this data set and what we did with it. Thanks, Rihad. So the data set that I'm going to use to show this, to show the capabilities of ClickPipes is OpenSky. OpenSky is a crowdsourced flight positions in real time. You can go to um, opensky.org. It's a nonprofit organization. You can download this data. It's basically everything. Every time an aircraft is in the sky, it reports its position. You can see an example row here. It's quite a flat schema. You've just got the ICAO 24 number, which is the transponder. It's lat long, and most aircrafts around the world when they're going over land anyway, report their position every sort of 10 seconds. So it's a pretty decent sized data set. It's about 60 to 70 million rows a day. Uh, you can download this, you can subscribe to it. If you want real-time access, you do have to pay it a little bit, but you can download historical data. For the uh, case of this demo, I'm actually using uh, some historical data uh, last week that basically I'm replaying in real time at the rate that it arrives. So, uh, respecting the uh, the time of the the time difference between the events, basically as we insert it onto um, Kafka. So let's take a look at how how easy this is. Um, 
Let's bring this up. Sorry, let's just switch. Okay, so if you're interested, this is the openskynetwork.org where you can go and download this data. So in order to visualize this, um, we wanted to build something whereby you could actually, hopefully I've got internet connectivity, that we could actually plot this. So the objective here was to in, stream, real, in real time stream all this data in and plot these flights on a real world. So this is just a simple OpenGL web demo and we hopefully will plot these points and we'll be able to see them streaming in as we ingest them from Kafka. Now ClickHouse is obviously a, a full database so you can do filtering. So also some filtering capabilities here once we, um, once we actually uh, have the data in. So we even have things, the ability to filter on things like polygons, geospatial uh, searches you can do in ClickHouse. You can also filter on obviously metadata, but things like origin country, for example, we overlay a geojson polygon, restrict the flights coming from a specific country. So let's just see, I'm sure you're all familiar with the Confluent UI. This is uh, the events, you can see them coming in. It's only, as I said, it's uh, 31.89 kilobytes per second. It's about 60 to 70 million events per day, as I said, so it's not a huge volume, but it's a decent uh, data set to play with. And you can see we even have things like the manufacturer name. Um, and I should say that this isn't just commercial aircraft, so even military aircraft, even um, cargo aircraft report these positions, so you get FedEx flights and private jets as well. So let's see how we can in, insert this into ClickHouse. Historically, I would have had to do a demo here with maybe a lot of command line, a lot of text, configuration files. That's all gone. This is a much slick, smoother experience. You can see here, this is the ClickHouse Cloud UI. So these are services in ClickHouse Cloud. You can think of a service as a cluster in ClickHouse. So a service scales elastically as you automatically, both horizontally and vertically. We scale vertically first, and then we scale horizontally. One of the new things about ClickHouse is that, unlike say a JVM-based technology, we can scale vertically up to potentially terabytes of RAM. So we're not limited by that we have to scale horizontally first. We would encourage you to scale vertically first because that reduces things like network and that improves query performance. So um, we abide by that principle in our cloud as well. We always encourage you to scale vertically first. And this cluster here, this is running in US East 2. Let's uh, actually connect to this cluster. So to do that, I can just click connect and we go into our SQL console. So our SQL console is an environment where you can issue queries against the service, against your cluster, and you can uh, do SQL. We even have things like you can do LLM, so LLM auto-completion, where I say, right, can you give me a query that's like this, and we'll complete the SQL. Um, and we have some visualization capabilities in this tool as well. As well as all of that, we've also now got this ability to import data. So I can go to imports now, and I'm presented with three options. At the moment, we just have file import in just from Kafka and file URL. Uh, Kah, uh, Rehad will talk a little bit about after the demo about how we can import data, how we plan to also support other data sources. So let's ingest some data from Kafka. Uh, we're presented with three options once we select this, uh, your traditional Confluent Cloud or, or your flavor of Confluent Cloud, which is what we're using here, but also OSS Kafka, Apache Kafka if you've got an endpoint, or AWS MSK as well. Let's, um, let's just select our for, for Confluent, put our integration, uh, give our click pipe a name, and then we need just to produce some basic credentials. So I'm just gonna use some credentials here, which I will change after the demo. <laughs> I'll delete these API keys, but for the purposes of keeping this nice and quick, we'll just put in some credentials, we produce a consumer group, and then just click next. So, at this point, we, we uh, detect all, all the available topics. I'm just gonna select the flight demos topic. And we perform schema inference on this. So there's no need to map column types or figure out what the column types are. We automatically detect the data. And then we use that to propose a table mapping for all of these columns. So we've detected these and we've mapped them to the equivalent ClickHouse types. You can go and do some advanced settings. So for you, those of you that are uh, at ClickHouse users, you can go and things like configure the primary key, the engine, the engine type. So if you want to doing, for example, CDC use case, you could go and uh, select replacing merge tree um, and change your primary keys. In this case, I'm just going to select an existing table. So I'm just going to select my open sky table, which I have here. And you can see the columns are automatically mapped across so that we don't have to worry about that. Uh, we've mapped all the column names and we have, I've prepared this table in advance so it's empty. And that's it. We complete setup, 
and, we, and data should start flowing in. So once this kicks off, you can see that this is starting to provision. This takes a, a few seconds. Uh, this is spinning up pods in our cloud environment. Uh, and this is detecting the, the amount of data that we're expecting or the number of compute that we need to assign to this. That's all transparently assigned. So you don't need to figure out how much do I need to scale. We just figure that out for you. And that's it. So if I start looking at the data now, it should start flowing in. So we've got data that's flowing in. I go back to my UI. Hopefully, we'll start to get some data flowing in, okay? So now we've got flight positions coming in. I should say that this is this has been streaming in since um, this has been streaming in since this morning. So we're catching up on the stream here. So you can see this is going to start catching up. And once it gets to 16 or 4:15 this afternoon, uh, this will uh, eventually stop. But you can see that now we've got you can start seeing the flights are starting to stream in here. So this is a, a nice simple demo. Uh, obviously, it's there's no it's more of a kind of bit of fun, but uh, it gives you a good idea. Maybe if I was interested in a particular operator like United, I could restrict to United Airlines. You could see just the flights. United, if I, maybe I have a, there you go. Okay. So back to Rehad for uh, intended roadmap, planned roadmap. Thanks, uh, Dale, for the demo. Uh, so we won't be competing with flight radar or anything. It was just a use case we wrote that will highlight pretty well the the usage of real-time data. And you saw that basically it took Dale literally like a minute to set up this pipeline. It's managed, it's monitored by us, so you don't need to do it. And there's like many things you don't see that are hidden, like try logics, that like scalability of this like ingest player consumer. And all of that is handled behind the scene by Clickhouse Cloud. So what's coming next in this category is basically more uh, data formats because you need to be where our users are. And we got a lot of requests for Avro, obviously, for protobuf as well, tabular formats, comma separated. But not only, people also want to connect other types of data sources. So ClickPipes is the foundations of uh, ClickHouse managed integrations. So it's not just for Kafka. Kafka is what we focused on at the beginning. We'll add more connectors in the streaming category, like like Kinesis, for example, Pops Hub, Event Hub, but also a lot of uh, our users asking for things like CDC from Postgres, from MySQL, from OLTP sources of data. A uh, big category for us also is uh, monitoring of uh, remote object storage buckets. So people put files in a staging area in an object store like S3, and we will be able to catch these changes and insert them in ClickHouse. So this is basically the roadmap for this feature. Think of it as a ETL with a single destination. <laughs> it's like the ETL of ClickHouse Cloud. So thanks for joining today and uh, hope you have questions for us. <laughs>